Lord, we're going to pause multiple times today and pray. And I thank you that it's because your word says my house will be called a house of prayer. Not a house of worship, not a house of outreach, not a house of offerings or anything like that. But my house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, there it is. Right there. Somebody's tapping into it. Somebody's tapping into it right now. Nothing else. It's from gratitude. It's from thanks. It's right there. It's from brokenness. The book of Isaiah says, this is who, this is the one whom I will turn my face to. And there's three qualifications. It's one who is humble, one who is broken or contrite in spirit, and one who trembles at my word. Can we just do those three things right now in this moment? Can we be humble and say, God, whatever you have for me today, Lord, I don't know what's best for myself. God, I don't have all the answers, but you do because you're God and I'm not. Can we just say, God, I'm broken over my sin. I'm broken over my choices. God, I'm broken over my attitude, my response, my humanity. I'm broken over my humanity. I'm broken over humanity itself. God, I'm broken over my sons and my daughters. God, I'm broken over my spouse. I'm broken in this moment and I don't have the answers, Jesus. And Lord, in the next few moments as we turn to your word, I pray that you would reveal what you want us to hear today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. I want to thank this awesome worship team today for leading us. I appreciate you guys so much. You'll never know the, the love they have for you and the love they have for this church and for, especially for the Lord, to prepare the way they prepare um, and to provide us. We, we talk about it like this. We want to have an unhindered worship experience. And as much as we can, when you lean into excellence, uh, it, it, excellence definitely honors God and inspires people. But one of the things I love about excellence is excellent, excellence reduces distraction. And these, this, these worship leaders, these uh, bandmates of mine, uh, this team that you have that serves us and serves the kingdom every week, we're just so blessed to have them. I'm blessed to be here. Amen. Give somebody a high five next to you. If you're joining online, throw something in the comments section. Let us know that you're not falling asleep, that you don't just have us on autopilot today, listening in the background while you're washing dishes or whatever. Uh, and we hope that you will, will come join us very, very soon. I want to just give a quick shout out to our pastor and Pastor Kathy. Let's, love, let's let them know how much we love them and miss them today. I know... I know they're probably watching right now, so we just want to tell you we love you, and thank you for all that you do. You guys are so amazing, and we appreciate you more than you'll ever know. Um, it's an honor to speak to you today. I, I'm extremely grateful um, for this opportunity. I don't get this opportunity on Sunday mornings very often. Our pastor hears from the Lord, and it's his goal and his effort to hear from the Lord every week for you. And I love that about our pastor. I was just talking to, to one of our leaders in, in youth ministry this week that that is just, that's something I love so much about my father-in-law and my mother-in-law is they, if you didn't know that, I'm their son-in-law, okay? Uh, that's me. My name is Pastor Dylan. So hi for the first time of the, if you're, t if you're tuning in, my name is Pastor Dylan and I married the pastor's daughter. Yes, I did. <laughs> And she married me. Yes, she did. I was a little doubtful. Uh, but praise God, I got her hooked, and she can't go nowhere. So, <laughs> But um, I'm just so blessed that we have a pastor that hears from the Lord. And uh, for him to relinquish this pulpit uh, to his staff is, is a blessing to us because he knows that, that he has tried to instill in, a, in his staff to hear from the Lord as well. 
And so I, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that Pastor Josh spoke such a, a challenging word last week to lean into the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm blessed by that. Extremely blessed by that. And today, um, I want to get into a few things uh, for a moment. And I, I, I'll, I'll try not to be long. I have a lot of content uh, to, to close in on a small amount of time. But it's going to be very simple, if that makes any sense. Um, a few weeks ago, I've been in this vein of prayer in preparation, I've been asking the Lord a lot of questions, and I, you guys know this about me. If you've been around long enough, you know that I'm a questions guy. I like to ask questions because I feel, I feel like if we ask and probe and ask the right question, that we can come up with the right, right answers, the solutions to our problems. And I think many times it also comes to who are we asking the question, right? Maybe who's even asking us questions. And today I'm going to get into that just a little bit more. And I, I feel like every time I talk to you, I lead out with these questions that, that I have. I ask God, God, what do you want me to speak to the church? What do you want me to speak to our teenagers? God, what do you want me to speak to my kids and tell my wife? And Lord, what, 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 what does this place need? What does the, the world need? What, what do my kids need? And I just, I just probe the Lord so often. God, what do you want of me? What are you asking of me? And I believe that very, very often he's asking us questions in return, right? He's asking us questions in return. And I've asked this question uh, over the last several weeks. God, why is it that people in our world today are struggling? Why is it that people today have returned to church in the midst of pandemic and some have not? Why is it that some, uh, it appears that some have be become more passionate, more enthusiastic, more in love with you, while others have not, while others have grown cold? And I came to this message today that I believe is a culmination of all the questions that I've been asking, and, and it's, it's so much, and so please bear with me. I know that you're going to be patient with me this morning, and you're going to say, Pastor Dylan, get to the point. When it comes to the point, you'll know. You'll feel it. See, in our world today, I believe that there are many reasons, and we cover these reasons on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights and in small groups and different settings in the church and in the, as the bride, we cover reasons why people fall away from the faith, reasons why people uh, abandon their faith, reasons why people turn their back on God and they backslide, we'll use that churchy word, backslide. But I believe it's this, where I'm going to highlight one reason in particular today of why this takes place, and I believe it's this because of a loss of memory. And again, I love that Pastor Josh spoke about this briefly this morning during worship, that we need to be reminded. And I'm here today to remind you of why we're here. I'm here to remind you of why we, why we show up why we commit our lives, why we commit our resources, why we commit our finances and our families, why we dedicate babies on Sunday mornings, why in just a few short weeks, we're, and just next week, we're going to have a water baptism service. This is why. This is why. And I'm going to remind you this morning of the, these things. It's interesting because we are flesh, and we, uh, 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 we, we have a lot of issues in our flesh, right? I'm 35 years old, and I'm already experiencing a little bit of back pain, a little soreness. You go to bed at night, and you kind of have that back pain. You wake up, you have that hip pain, and you're like, Lord, is this forever? <laughs> I don't know. At some point, and you're like, dude, you're 35. Wait till you get 45. Okay, I will. <laughs> I'll wait. Please, please, Lord. <laughs> Jesus, come, because <laughs> I'm feeling it now. Or maybe you forget something, right? You forget your keys, it's been two weeks. I can't find my keys. If you get your wallet, right? Have you ever forgotten your wallet? That is like panic attack 101, okay? I have no clue where my wallet is. Where's my keys? Where's my stuff? And as it seems like as you get older, those things happen often, more and more often. And you're like, dude, you're 35. Okay, I get it. I get it. Remind me that, okay? When you turn 45, 55, 65, uh, we can talk a little bit more about forgetting stuff. And this is where we're at today. We forget a lot of things. We misplace a lot of things. That's human nature. That's the body. That's stuff that happens 
uh, naturally, and it's painful, and it's inevitable, and I hate it that I forget stuff. Some of our conditions that we have, we have remedies for those conditions. Some of the remedies uh, that we have might be a diet or might be a supplement that you take, might be vitamins or getting the proper sleep, might be exercise, right? That's the human body. But what about the spirit? Today I want to talk about the spirit because Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And he says that unless a, por- a person is born of water and of the spirit, right, that he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what does this mean? Well, you guys know this, that a baby is born in water, a fluid. Water surrounding a baby is called amniotic fluid. And when that amniotic sac breaks, there is a moment where the mother will say, I think my water just broke. You guys heard this phrase. And, and if you're not educated on this phrase, you've heard it in movies before. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard uh, a family member tell another family member, her water just broke. And there's moments, and if you're a mom, you know what this is like. And there come moments also when in that process, in that stage, in the safety of the mother's womb, the due date is quickly approaching and uh, the water has to be broken, right? In order to deliver that baby in a timely manner. And this is what's interesting this morning as we're talking, as I'm in, in sharing this with you. Jesus used this analogy to explain to Nicodemus that being born or being reborn means that you have to have a spiritual rebirth and are born anew into this world and see again with a new perspective, a a fresh set of lenses. And that's why when we talk about being reborn, we do this symbol. Pastor Joss talked about this symbol of, of being in a pool of water and coming up out of this water. It's not that we're just washed, but we are literally coming into this world anew. We're being reborn. Jesus is saying a person must be born of water and of the Spirit. And here's this problem. We believe life happens at conception, right? in this room. We believe life happens at conception, but I want to say this too, life also happens at birth. And what so many fail to see is that the concepts of Christianity are not enough to the life of a Christian. We love the concepts of Christianity, faith, love, generosity, forgiveness, grace, healing, prosperity, blessing. We love those things. Like as Christians, we hold fast to those truths and those pillars of our faith. But that's just it. Many of us never move beyond concepts and into actual birth. We fail to live out sacrifice. We fail to live out dying to self. We fail to live out persecution and being persecuted. As Pastor Josh talked about this last week, we fail to live out rejection, right? We do. And Jesus told his disciples even to take up their cross daily. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's so much more to this life as Christians than just forgiveness and grace and those things. There is sacrifice. There is dying to self. And Jesus today wants to bring some of those things in to the forefront of your mind. There's one thing that I've learned spiritually about Roe versus Wade. In the case of 1973, which essentially was created to protect a woman's rights, right? To protect a woman's right to choose to kill her child. And I'm not gonna get into that today But I want you to hear me when I say this. The thing that I learned recently about abortion is that conception without birth is tragedy. Not just physically, but spiritually. If you're taking notes today, you need to write that down. Conception without birth is tragedy. If the devil can get you to abort your spiritual birth after the initial concepts of a believer takes place, then he's beat you. I think many times in our lives, we come to these revelational moments, these epiphanies, if you will, and we're like, man, there is a God. And we start wondering and we start questioning. And if the devil can get you to abort that thought before it's manifested into a choice, he's got you. 
But this is what happens also. In the church, we never experience the joys of suffering with Jesus. Furthermore, if the devil can get the church to stay in the womb, in conception, it does more damage to the bride in the process. We, the church, never experience the joys of suffering. We never experience persecution. We live in the comfort of our, our womb, sitting next to our twin brothers and sisters on the pew every week. And again, the problem with staying in the womb is that eventually we outgrow it, and we either need to come out of the water or we die. We have to step into Christianity in all of its fullness. We have to step into every aspect of being a follower. And I talked about this moment ago. There are things that we've picked and chose to follow. And then there are others that we haven't. And it's sad. A moment ago, I talked about memory loss. That's just my intro, okay? Okay. <laughs> That's just, that's just us getting started. It has nothing really to do with where we're going today. Maybe it does. But a moment ago, I talked to you about memory loss. And from a physical standpoint, we talked about the spirit as well. And I want to dive into that a little bit deeper. Let's pray. Before we move any further, I want to pray. Lord, Father, we come to you knowing that your word is living and it's active and it's sharp. And God, it cuts deep to separate things in our lives that we know need to come out, things in our lives that we know are hidden in the darkness. And Lord, as David said, God, would you search our hearts? God, would you search our hearts in this moment? God, would you bring change, significant change to us today? Lord, before this concept is squelched, before the, the, the next several moments is squelched by the enemy, God, would you help us? to be reborn. Maybe some of us rededicated to you today, Jesus. Lord, I pray that over every person in this room. I pray that over every person watching online today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. If you want to open your Bible, if you want to flip open your Bible app, I'll wait on you for just a moment. I'm excited uh, about this particular portion of scripture because there's some revelational things in here that not many of us think about. In fact, uh, on Weekend for God, Timothy McCain actually preached from this passage of Scripture a couple weeks ago. And we're going to look at it from a different vantage point. We're going to see it from some different, uh, different side views, okay, some different peripherals. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say... John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15, it says, he, he said to them, but who do you say I am? I want to highlight that for just a moment. We're going to come back to that. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you. You know. You know what's crazy is, I think many of us, we've been doing this for a long, long time, and we are kind of maybe a little bit like Simon, where we have some things that we know, and it makes us dangerous, right? Simon was, was almost too wise for his own good sometimes. Like, he just thought he knew moment ago, I prayed, would we be humble and would we be, would we be broken? Would we, would we be contrite? God, would you make us tremble at your word? And I think Simon kind of, I, when, we, when we talk about Simon in the Bible, we don't see somebody that's humble, right? We see somebody that's like, look, who's, where are we going to go? Who, who are we going to knock out first, right? Whose ear am I going to chop off to, say, to save Jesus? And he thinks he's got all the answers, and today I want to ask you, would you just put what you think on hold for a moment and answer these questions, not from a place of what you think, but from a place of truth? And there's a difference. Here's an interesting thought. Caesarea Philippi, 
I, I kept wondering when I heard about this city, why Jesus chose to ask these questions in, in Caesarea, of all places. It seemed like odd questions for him to be asking his followers too, right? So why do you think Jesus asked these questions in this location? It's significant that Jesus chose to ask these profound questions here since there were few areas in the entire world at that point in time that were more, uh, had more religious weight and importance than Caesarea did. Writer David Patfield wrote this, this area of the Roman Empire was littered with temples and Syrian gods and was a place where Greek gods looked down a place where the, the most important river in Judaism sprang to life. A place where Caesarean worship dominated the landscape. And it was here of all places that Jesus chose to ask these questions. It was here of all places that Jesus stands and asks men, who do they say I am? Who do you say that I am? In the midst of all of these temples of worship, all of these gods, if you will. Jesus is standing with his disciples in this landscape of sin and, and this landscape of fallenness. And he asks his disciples, who do you say I am? All of these philosophies, all of these methods of thinking, all of these ways and these, these ways to get to heaven and be made right with God, right? Which, which, which way is your way? Well, who do you say that I am? In a world with so many opinions and philosophies, belief systems, I believe that Jesus is asking that of us today. Doesn't that sound familiar? This place that we're talking about, Caesarea Philippi, sounds a lot like today. A, like, a lot like this moment in time, right? Who do you say that I am in the midst of pandemics, in the midst of mandates, in the midst, midst of government restrictions and politics and social issues and social injustices? Who do you say that I am? He's asking you that question today. Who do you say that I am? When there's somebody on the right trying to spill something in your ear, there's somebody on the left trying to spill something into your ear. When there's somebody wherever else in your life, on your news feed, on your Facebook posts, somebody somewhere is trying to get you to believe something, but who do you say Jesus is? Are you with me today? Who is he to you? Not to somebody else. Who is he to you? Who is Jesus? Or have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? This is what we've been talking about the whole time today. From the moment we started worship, remembering, to this moment right now, who is Jesus to you? Or have you forgotten who he is? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 through 14, it says this. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Failing to observe his commands his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, I want to stop for a moment. I really want you to pay attention to this next sentence. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses, when you settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. What does this sound like? That's the American dream right there, right? It is. That's the American dream, prosperity and blessings and possessions and stuff. If you want it, we got it. If you don't have money, okay, it's all right. We'll just give you a line of credit. If you don't have a line of credit, you know what? The government's going to give it to you. <laughs> We're good. I want all my stuff. I want my blessings. I want my, my sheep and my, my flocks and my herds. I, 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 all that stuff's growing. It's good. I'm prospering. It's multiplied. But the Lord warned a nation not to forget him in the accumulation of flocks and herds flocks and herds. Look where we're at now. We're beyond flocks and herds. 
right? And if he warned them back then, how much more is that applicable to right now? Flocks and herds. Wow. Whew. Jesus, I hope you see where I'm going with this today. Jesus. So we've developed sort of spiritual amnesia. We've gotten, we've forgotten God, not just as a nation, but as families. And as some of us, even in our churches, speaking to those online today, we've forgotten God. We've forgotten God. We, li we live in the most blessed and free nation on the planet, and we've forgotten who Jesus is to us. We're living off of our parents and our grandparents' relationship with Jesus. Some of us grew up in the church. Some of us have been here from the beginning, and we know who God was to them, but we can't say who God was to us. And I'm here today as a, as a, a representation of a grandmother's prayers. I'm here today as a representation of a praying mom and a praying dad. I'm here as a representation of that, but are, where are you at? Who is Jesus to you? We can't live on the coattails of the relationships that our parents had with Jesus. We can't. Who is Jesus to you? On Wednesday night, I was telling this story about my kids in the car. My wife is a planner. Do we have any planners in the house today? If you're a planner online, just, just plug in. I'm a planner. I'm not talking about planter, like maybe, maybe, maybe you're a farmer. I'm not a planner. Like you like to plan ahead. My wife texts me, <laughs> I'm cracking up. She texts me the other day and she goes, I know what I want for Christmas. And I'm like, oh yeah, what? what? Oh, I'm like real excited because it's hard to sometimes to get gifts for my wife because she don't ask for much. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Where can I go? I'm going to Hoppy tomorrow, right? You, got, you give me some hints, I'm good. She wants a planner. A journal, a, day, a daily plan. I, I want this. I have to have this. Oh, wow. What <laughs> sweet. It's super easy. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. What else do you want? <laughs> can, you, can, can I spoil you a little bit? Well, that, to her, that's spoiling. My wife's a planner, okay? We like to go on trips with our kids. We like to be in the car. And if any of you have ever been in the car with kids that are under the age of 16, no, just, just kidding. If you're under the age of like 10 and below, it can be pandemonium in the car. You're stopping every five minutes to go to the bathroom. I got to pee this. I got to go to the bathroom that. Somebody projectile vomits on the way in the trip. You know, it just ends up being an exhausting time sometimes in the car. We have four kids under the age of 10. We're crazy. We are. But my wife, you know what she does? She plans. What can we do to avoid all of that? Who can we strap in a diaper? <laughs> right? So if, I, if they got to go to the bathroom, just go on yourself. Okay, please. She, she, will, she will plan the whole trip out in segments to where everybody has like this section in front of them, in the seat in front of them, they'll have a pocket organizer, and you're going to get into section one this hour, section two this hour. You got a snack right here, okay? My wife's got it planned out to where, okay, now it's iPad time, now it's nap time, and so it makes the trip amazing. It's amazing. And I just drive. I love it. I just drive. And if somebody's acting up, I go, honey. Somebody's in the back fussing. You got it, babe. I love it. I love driving. Love driving. So this is what happens. We get in the car, and she f figures out ways to keep the trip going smooth. And it reminded me of this when I was looking back, thinking about those moments. The enemy wants to keep you roaming on the wrong path as long as he can, making it harder to find your way back. How many of you ever missed an exit when you're driving? And you didn't realize it. You're just kind of like listening to your music and you, maybe you're listening to a podcast or maybe, you know, you're just kind of like thinking and you're stuck in your own head and then it's two exits and then it's three and you have no clue where you're at now. <laughs> you panic. 
and freak out, have a freak out moment. It happens to me all the time. And if I don't have my wife in the car, honey, got an exit coming, oh, okay, okay. I go on autopilot. I don't know about you husbands, but I do. It's just something that I, when I'm driving, it's like I'm in, I'm, I'm in, like, I'm in, I'm in my, my own world, and it's amazing. Honey, you missed that turn. Well, you didn't tell me. <laughs> how, many, how many wives have ever heard that? <laughs> you didn't tell me, honey. <laughs> you know, that's what the devil wants to do to us as a church, as followers. He wants us to be on autopilot. He wants to pacify us. He wants to be like, he wants us to be like ki- the kids in the back of the car who don't even know where we're going. I don't even know where we're going. You have a snack. Okay. Right? When are we going to get there? Do you know even know where where is? No. Right? That's exactly where the devil wants us. He wants to pacify you. He wants to get you on cruise control. He wants to get you on autopilot. He wants to get you to a place where you don't ask questions anymore. He wants to get you to a place. The ultimate goal as a parent when you're on a road trip with your kids is to get them to fall asleep. Because then it's like, whoa, we can drive. Right? That's exactly what the devil wants to do to us. He wants us to be on sleep mode where we've dozed off and before we know it, we're, we're further on the trip than we ever thought we'd be. Maybe we're even at the destination. But he just wants you to sleep. I think everything's okay. Daddy's got this. Mom, can I have a snack? Okay, okay. Right? I you to write this down. If he can distract you along the way, he can keep you wandering longer. If he can pacify you along the way, he can keep you wandering longer. If he can get you to sleep along the way, he can keep you wandering longer. If he can get you to forget, he's beat you. Man, that's the worst part. That's the worst part. Putting your hand on a door and not knowing what you're doing, right? Unless you're going to the bathroom, then you'll remember. I mean, it's like, you ever put your hand on the doorknob and you forget what you're doing? I don't even know what I'm doing right now. I was going to go out in the garage for something. I don't know what for. And that's the state of the church. Sometimes we're in this 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 mode where we're just kind of cruising. We're just going, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, amen. And we're in this mode, and, and the devil's got you exactly where he wants you not improving, not asking questions, not knowing the journey, not knowing where you're heading, not knowing where you're going. And we wonder why today in this world, there are so many teenagers that are walking around in anxiety because we have parents, we have people that are modeling the same model of being on autopilot all the time, leaving and going to work, checking in, putting my hours in, checking out, going home, and and I'm just going to eat my dinner and I'm going to go to bed and doing it over and over and over and over again. I'll go to church on Sunday as long as I'm saying amen, throwing something in the offering, I'm good. But you're not. You're not. Pastor says it like this. He said he'll make you go further than you ever thought you'd go. He'll make you pay more than you ever thought you'd pay and make you stay longer than you ever thought you'd stay. That's exactly what he wants from you. He wants you to go and wander and be on cruise control. In the midst of this world that we're in today and where where we seem to be doing a lot of thinking about what we believe and We seem to be throwing our opinions real easy on social media about what we believe. We seem to be telling people what we believe real, real often. It's kind of interesting how sometimes we really don't even remember who Jesus is to us. I want to challenge you this. That if I, I asked that question a moment ago, who is Jesus to you? And you couldn't immediately find an answer. You might be on autopilot. When I asked that question a moment ago, who is Jesus to you? And you had no answer right on the tip of your tongue. Right now, in this moment, you might be on autopilot. And how dare we try to go tell the world how things should be when we can't even say who Jesus is to us? How dare us? How are we going to reach this world when we can't even reach the tip of our tongue with an answer. Who is Jesus to you? Here's the solution. We got to stop hitting the snooze button and we got to roll out of bed, sleepyhead. We got to wake up. 
we got to come out of the womb. Are you with me today, church? Many of you, those concepts that you had, they're just concepts. They're not action. It's time to put them to action. Many of you, you've never experienced suffering. You've never experienced rejection. You've never experienced sacrifice, real sacrifice. You've never experienced faith, stepping out in faith. Maybe it looks like that to you. What is it that you haven't experienced yet? What is it that you haven't put to practice that we talk about every week, week in and week out? And you're saying, well, I'm good. I got my sheep, I got my flocks and my herds. Everything's multiplying, it's good. Don't forget about them. Don't forget about them. As I was preparing this message today, the Lord dropped the scripture in my heart, and I'm gonna read it to you in just a moment. But why is it that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is a task on our list? Why is it that Jesus has become a to-do list for us? A moment ago, we're singing about who he is and we want him and nothing else. And you guys are thinking about what's on the crock pot at home and you're thinking about going home and, and, and today and, and man, I got so much stuff I gotta do and you know, I just checked this off my list, I'm good. No, he's everything. Church, he's everything. He's my rescuer in times of trouble. He's my rescuer when I have angst in my heart, when I'm living in depression, when I'm living in struggle, when I'm living in strife. He's my redeemer when I've gone too far off the path, when I've been on autopilot for too long. He reminds me it's time to wake up. He's my savior. He made my life right with God when I said yes to him, when I accepted his grace, when I accepted his mercy. He's a forgiver. Wow. I love that the word says that that if you don't forgive others, he can't forgive you. Maybe some of you are here today. I don't know what you're struggling with, what issues you have, what things you have not given to the Lord. Maybe it is forgiveness. I don't know. But today, those things that we talked about that are hard to practice, maybe for you it's your wallet, maybe maybe it is generosity. And when you walk up to the altar today, you better leave a, a check on the altar for Jesus. Not because we need it, but because you've been battling your heart for, for months, maybe years. And I dare that church ask for my money. It's not about, we don't, we don't need your money. It's about him. It's about giving him our life. It's about him being holy, him being separate and set apart, that we can look up and we can shift our gaze to the hills where our help comes from. He's my help. And you know what's crazy? He is Adonai Elroy, the God who sees me. Wow, that's crazy to me. That's one of my favorite phrases, Adonai Elroy. He is the God who sees me. He knows where you're at. He knows what exit you missed. He knows the the moments in your life where you've been on autopilot, where you've stopped, where you've kept hitting the snooze button every time you walk in. You go in the weekend for God. You you head in to to go teach and you head in to go serve and you head in to go do your thing. And now I'm going to just go throw in a couple bucks here and there. I'm going to be the good Christian that I should be. And all deep down inside, you're miserable. Why is it that so many Christians, if they're doing what they should be doing, are miserable? It's because you don't know who Jesus is to you. You've forgotten. It's because you're just going through the motions. And today, we are asking and we're believing that we're going to baptize people next week. And if you can't say who Jesus is to you, you have to be able to say who Jesus is to you. We talked about that last week. Pastor Just talked about us having a story. You got to have that story. It's got to be right there. Jesus. In the book of Luke, we're going to sing in just a moment. We're going to praise the Lord. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 17 through 21, it's a powerful, powerful, powerful moment. If you turn to your Bibles there, Luke chapter 4, 17 through 21. God. I'm going to rewind back to verse 16. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, where he was a boy, right? 
And as this was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And Jesus stood up and read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And Jesus unrolls the scroll of the prophet and found the place where it is written. I want you to hear me when I say this, church. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and set I set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus rolled up the scroll and had a mic drop moment. I'm here. Your Savior's here. Your Messiah is here. Your bridge to heaven is here. Your sacrificial lamb, he's here. And they didn't receive him. We've forgotten, church. We've forgotten that's who he is to us. We've forgotten that's who he is to us. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. We're going to sing this song in just a second, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the blinders off. I want you to come off of autopilot. Don't hit the snooze button again today. There are so many things happening in this world, so many things that are getting your attention so many things that are, are distracting you, things that you even own, things that you surf the internet for that you want, you desire, that you can't have. Things that you just want to put in your possession list. Things that you want to stock your garage with. Things that you want to put in your jewelry box. Things that you want to put in your wardrobe. And that is what consumes your mind. And today, it's, it may be just that simple, just that simple, that our minds are consumed with so much stuff that it, there's no room in our minds for Jesus. Jesus, I pray over this congregation. I pray over these believers right now. Lord, let us not let the devil pacify us any longer. Lord, he, he is not going to have us right where he wants us anymore. He is not going to have that. that. He's not going to have his way with the church any longer. God, I pray that we would wake up. In this moment, I pray that many of us, the concepts, the conceptual agreement that we had made to be a Christian would begin to be lived out and we would come out of the womb and into full growth today. God, many of us in this place, Lord, let us, let us put to practice the things of, of sacrifice and faith and and self-sacrifice and picking up our cross daily and denying ourselves, Lord, let us put to practice suffering. Let us put to practice rejection. God, let us not be afraid of those things. Let us embrace those things as Paul did. Lord, let them become a thorn in our side that we're glad to have. God, let them become a, a, a cross that we bear that we're glad to bear because we share in its glory with you, Jesus. And God, today, as we declare who you are, that you're holy, that you're mighty, that you're awesome, that you're righteous, that you're loving, that you're, you're caring, God, that you're our rescuer, that you're our forgiver, that you're our friend, that you're our confidant, that you're our representative, God. Jesus, as we come to you today, I pray that you would put inside of us a testimony. You would put inside of us a witness. Lord, the things that Pastor Josh talked about last week, put those in us today, God. Wake us up. Wake us up, Jesus. Wake us up. Would you stand to your feet today? I'm not going to give you further direction. If you want to come to the front, you come to the front. I just want you to respond to, to this message in the way that you feel like you need to, that God is putting in you to respond. That means you should be moving. That means you should be responding. That means there need to be action right now in this moment. Whatever that looks like for you, whether it's kneeling, whether it's laying on your face, whatever you have to do, we're going to sing this song to the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to consider waking up. Would you get out of bed, sleepyhead? Come on.